uh, Jack is correct. I kind of grew up in Washington, actually. I watched the Army McCarthy hearings back in the early 1950s instead of a, it was a puppet show called Howdy Doody. Uh, and that was going on, and I grew up as a Democrat. And then when they decided to become pro-abortion, I left that and was a nothing for a long time. The first Republican for president I voted for was Ronald Reagan. And I helped work in, in his, uh, his campaign. In fact, I helped devise some tactics for him to use because my wife and I had been going around talking to right to life conventions in a number of states. And we were both working for Congressman Bob Norton at the time from Southern California. And uh, Ronald Reagan lost Iowa to George Bush. And the gentleman who was the executive secretary to Ronald Reagan's cabinet when he was governor of California came to me because he knew I was involved, obviously, with politics. He worked on the Capitol Hill for Congressman uh, Bob Michael of Illinois. And he told us about Ronald Reagan's support of the right to life, and Bob Dornan confirmed this. So what I did, I drafted a letter from Nellie Gray for her signature to Ronald Reagan, and a letter from Ronald Reagan back to Nellie Gray, asking questions about the right to life, different aspects of the right to life. We worked on this for a little bit. Gave these draft letters to Nellie and to the governor, and they approved them. And then I took these letters, the final sign-offs, and sent them to right to life organizations in about 12 or 13 states that I had given talks in at conventions, telling them this is what you need to do. You have to get behind Ronald Reagan. And these were all primary states, not convention states, where they slept the delegates by conventions. Reagan beat Bush uh, in all those states after that. And he knew that the right to life was for health again. So that was That was my contribution there. And actually, prior to that, I had been working with a fellow named John Mackey, who was with a group called the Ad Hoc Committee in Defense of Life, which was funded by the Buckley family. They had a newsletter. And John had done a Freedom of Information Act request. What that means is you're asking somebody in the government, the agencies, to give you documents. And if it's a, in a certain category of documents, you can have it. This can include emails. It can include memoranda, phone conversations. It can include policy statements or anything like that. Anyway, unless it's exempt, like a personnel file, you usually have a right to get this. Well, John found out that there were about 286 or 87,000 children killed by abortion with funding from the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. Now, this was 1976, no, 70, 75, if I said. Remember, Roe v. Wade is in January of 73. And I took this information, this FOIA answer that John had received, and I went to the uh, House of Representatives, and I pulled a congressman off the floor who I knew from Southern uh, Maryland, Bob Bauman, and I gave him this information, and I said, look, we need to have an amendment on one of the appropriations bills. Now, why that? The Democrats who controlled the House and the Senate were bottling up pro-life legislation in committee and it would never get to the floor. But an appropriation bill, you have to pass it every year because it funds the federal government. They must be passed every year. If they're not passed, there's no money to spend. So an amendment on the appropriation bill is a way to force a vote, a public vote, on an issue. So I said to Congressman Bauman, you need to put an amendment cutting off funding of abortion. First of all, there was no authority to do this. And the abortions were funded under these birth control programs that allegedly were supposed to prevent the so-called need for abortion, which is ridiculous. But anyway, that, that's where it was. So I gave my suggestions and then this FOIA to Bob Bauman. About two weeks later, he gave it to a little-known congressman from Illinois who turned out to be Henry Hyde, who hand wrote an amendment on a piece of paper, walked it up to the clerk of the house. The clerk was ordered to read it by the speaker, and it started this huge fight over abortion funding. So that is how that particular thing began. And then when I worked, my work, wife and I both worked for Congressman Board, and I devised other amendments to cut off funding for military abortions, for AID, State Department, 
abortions in the District of Columbia and abortions within the health care plans of the federal employees. The reason you need to do this is you need to get a clean vote on a public policy issue. Otherwise, citizens don't know what is going on behind their backs. And it's often very difficult to get these votes at times. As a matter of fact, Tip O'Neill, in fact, ended up changing the rules to make it harder to get record votes. Now, we were able to overcome those things, but not all the time. So the first thing you want to do if you're trying to affect public policy is you have to put the public policy out for the public. And it's got to be in a very simple way. You can't have four steps or something. You've got to have something that's kind of intuitive. So a vote cutting off abortion funding is kind of intuitive. Everybody can see it, and you can understand what that is. So if you're working with state legislators, you've got to get them to commit to do something to the state budget to cut off funding of X. Even if you lose, as long as you get a record vote, you're winning because then you can change the future. If you don't get a record vote, you can't change the future, and these guys can lie to you, and they will lie to you. So I have to fight with my own Republican leadership in Virginia, who refused to go on record this year, even on the Hyde Amendment. They did with something called, I moved to pass by the amendment. And I called them a bunch of gutless wimps, because they are. Yeah. But that's what, they succeeded in doing this, and they all got together. So next time, I'm gonna have to get people with cameras up in the, um, uh, you know, where you, where you watch, Gallery. Gallery. galleries, to take a picture. And I'm going to have to show these pictures around to people in Virginia because they are so craven with this thing. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that, that's just what you have to do. You have to resort to this tactic to do it. And the reason you do it is because of the statement in the book of John, evil loves the what? Darkness. Mm -hmm. That's why getting record votes or using what's called the Freedom of Information Act is very important to shaping public policy. Now, I passed out to you two bills that I drew up this year. This bill right here, House Bill 1314. This is drawn up in response to the Obama administration mandate, the HHS mandate, to require employers to provide sterilization, birth control, and abortion pills to their employees and to mandate that in a private insurance policy that you are now required to purchase, which is one of the stupider Supreme Court decisions, that you must pay for abortion pills or birth control for your minor kids. And this must be given to your children behind your back. Now, I gave a talk to the Sorensen Institute, which is kind of an offshoot at the University of Virginia. I had some lady there who I thought was the Sandra Fluke. You know, they want to be. And she was just mad that I didn't want to pay for her birth control. And I said, well, ma'am, do you have $9 a month? Because if you do, you can go to Walmart or Target and buy the birth control. And I said, well, where do you get the principle that I have to fund this? She said, well, these things are funded in other parts of the government. I said, that may be true. But it's not me in my policy compelled by a statute which penalizes me if I don't pay it. In other words, they were saying, well, this one guy said, well, uh, I don't want to have my money spent for war. I said, okay. But you are not required to give the money to the munitions manufacturer. You're not required to buy the gun. You're not required to go yourself. And in fact, there's conscientious objection, exemptions for people who don't want to fight in a war. But under Obamacare, you will pay you will do this. This is like this, uh, you know, Muslim thing of uh, convert, die, or pay, uh, pay the fine. And, and I'm not exaggerating. That's exactly what it is. This diminitude that you will be subject to this. So we are now being subject to an invasion of our conscience by the authorities in the government. And I went and drafted this bill, House Bill 1314, and what I did. I went and got the assistance of two very competent attorneys. One who was a conservative, she is a on the uh, is a dean at what was a dean at Catholic U Law School, who was on the Civil Rights Commission, appointed there by Ronald Reagan. His name is Bob Destro. And I got another uh, law professor from the University of Virginia, 
who's a liberal, whose wife is the president of the University of Virginia. His name is Doug Laycock. He thinks two guys can get married or should be allowed to get married. But he helped me draw this up because what he sees here is an invasion of the First Amendment liberty. And the First Amendment liberty that the founders wanted to protect, and two people were very instrumental in this. But one, a member of the Carroll family in Maryland, and James Madison of Virginia. They wanted to protect conscience. And if you, if you look in the Constitution, part of it says no one may be required to take an oath as a condition of holding federal office. Because an oath is a swearing to God as a witness that you will do or not do certain things. And that is a really a, a clamping of, of your conscience. So the founders did not want for holding federal office that like you had to be an Episcopal or you had to believe in the Trinity. Because the certain state laws at the time in 1789 did require some of those to hold state office. But they didn't want to do that for federal law, so they expressly rejected that. Now in here, I gave like a history lesson of these whereas clauses. Unfortunately, the Republicans uh, leadership, Speaker Bill Howell, did not even want this bill to be heard because they didn't want any controversy at all. That's where we are right now. This bill was not even put before a committee for a public hearing because they don't want to talk about it. Now, if you really want to talk about something, you must be very scared of it. But the Republican leadership in this country at the state and federal level is totally intimidated by social issues and all they want to talk about is jobs and the economy. Well, we had a guy run for president on jobs and the economy. Did he win? The answer is no. And in fact, I, I remember uh, probably several months ago on a, a big road in the county, actually the road that I helped get built before I was involved with uh, being a delegate, I saw a Hispanic gentleman and he had two uh, bumper strips in the back of his car. One was Vivo uh, Cristo Rey, Long Live Christ the King, and the other was Obama Biden. I thought, how did this guy get this way? We missed an opportunity to prevent this from happening. How? Romney could have said, look, this local church that you depend upon for your social welfare or help in the community is going to be put out of business because they're probably not going to want to be funding abortion pills for their employees. So you're not going to get any help. Now, this may not have converted this Hispanic voter into someone voting for Romney, but I don't think this person would have voted or put a bumper strip on the back of his car for Obama Biden. Because his means of social welfare benefits would have been pulled out from under him. So you, wherever you live, how many people here live in Maryland? Okay, and how many in Virginia? Okay, how many in the District of Columbia? Okay. You have got your legislators to take these issues on. Whether you win or lose, you simply have got to service the problem. And so for the long term, if you live in Maryland or Virginia, circulate this, ask your legislator what they think about it. I don't care if you're going to lose. It's like saying, hey, Marshall, would you defend your wife if you saw three thugs walking down the street and they're going to attack her? Well, I don't want to make them fight. I don't want to I wouldn't care about the odds. I would do what I could do, whether it be right. like or not. If you love someone, you will act. You will act even sacrificially if you have to. So measuring whether you do something or not by the outcome, I don't know that you should do that all the time. It's not saying you should uh, act with abandon, but if a fight's worth fighting, forget the odds. Line up things as best you can line them up to expose the evil that is going on because unless you expose the evil there's no reason to get other people mobilized to change the evil and if you look at the look at the words of the of the declaration jefferson talks about that evils are sufferable rather than people wanting to do anything so when you're reading bad news to your neighbors they're not going to want to hear it because nobody wants to hear bad news but if this bad news is going to go after them in their personal life you, they can't do anything at that point. They have to submit or fight back. So you have got to have 
be a kind of an engineer to get your neighbors and friends to recognize that they've got to stand up in some way, whether it's just writing a delegate or a state senator or calling them or sending an email or writing a letter to the editor or doing a calling show. We have got to change the public opinion and you don't do that in secret. So those are one of the things that I suggest. And in the long run, we're going to have to have studies on where the reach of the state goes and where it stops. Because we're getting into areas where there's no privacy for anybody. Now, I don't like to use the word privacy in relationship to the legal thing because there, there really is no affirmative right to privacy in the Constitution. There's a Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. And the right to privacy, in fact, was created by a devious Catholic, Justice Brennan on the Supreme Court, who gave all his thinking to Douglas so he could hide and not take the blame for this, who invented a right to privacy for birth control for married couples. It then went from birth control for married couples in Griswold to birth control for singles with uh, Bill Baird pushing this in, um, it's called Isis that versus Baird in Massachusetts. And these were the Supreme Court decisions that led to Roe versus Wade and Doe v. Bolton in 19, uh, 1973. I will never forget one time uh, at a, a National Right to Life convention up in Boston at which Bishop Fulton Sheen gave a talk. Bill Baird was outside picketing. And I decided, I'm going to dog you. So I followed him like I was stalking him, I guess it would be called right now, but it was in a public place and it was part of a demonstration, so he'd have a rough time getting a conviction on me. But I stalked him back and forth and back for about, about more than an hour. I, I, he, I would not let him shake me. And he turned to me and was looking at me and cursing and screaming. And when I looked at him, I swear there was another set of eyes behind the ones I saw. I never felt such a bizarre presence in my entire life looking at somebody. I thought, you got a problem. But this is what this guy was, was doing. And he was just incensed about this. He even talked to a delegate, I'm oh, sorry, a member of the uh, Massachusetts General Court, which is like our General Assembly, into putting a bill in decriminalizing bestiality. So he was all over, all over the ballpark. And you are, you are fighting spiritual powers behind this, which means you first fortify yourself with prayer, and then you go into think about what you're doing, and then you act on it. Because we're social beings, you've got to go out and act. Unless you're an anchorite in a monastery, you are living among people. You've got to go out and somehow reflect this will that you talk about. Remember in the New Testament, the lady finds uh, you know, uh, some coins that she lost. We're not told what she does with the money, but what does she do with it? She spreads the good news. You don't keep what you hold as a good to yourself, which is why it's false when the homosexuals are claiming they're looking just for tolerance. Uh -uh. They're looking to coerce the rest of us with their legal decisions that they're going with. And this is not tolerance. This is about mass compulsion to accept their, these, these, these policies. And clearly, none of this would have gone on except for the birth control revolution, specifically the pill. There was no pill back in the 1930s and you didn't have these problems. You had much more stable families. The more the government has gotten involved in distributing so-called you know, birth control pills and condoms and diaphragms or whatever, the more the dissolution of the family has proceeded and the more acceptable it is for there not to be a father around for the child. To the point where among African Americans in the United States, almost 74% of births are out of wedlock. More than 40% of all births are out of wedlock right now. Not good for kids. The father was never around. It's not a case of there being a marriage and, and then even a divorce or someone dying. The father was never around. How this happened? It did not happen independent of the legalization of the birth control pill. And again, the, the furtherance of this with funding of this by federal money all over the United States. It's supposed to stop welfare, it's gotten worse, has not gotten better. So those are some of the things you would have to look at and you need to have your legislators look at a long range thing about privacy. Because again, if you can have these drones in the sky going after you, can they be looking in your house? Now, where, where does the privacy end? 
It's a long kind of privacy on the abortion and birth control. And it's, a, it's another extension of this invasion of privacy by the government. So you, you've got to have this balance because we're being compelled into these circumstances where you're not going to be, be able to resist easily. So let me go to this other bill right here. This was a bill that I put in this year. I did get a hearing on this, but I got the most flim flam arguments against it. It's a bill stating that you cannot have an abortion for reasons of the sex of the child. And the reason you do this is you want to make it hard for your opponents to fight you. Now, if your opponents are the feminists, and it's mostly females who are getting aborted, they're in a box as to dealing with this. It's very hard for them to deal with this. So you have to make it easy for our side to win. And the feminists don't even want to say this. So what they say is, because there is data in medical journals and from the United States Census uh, office, that at least with Asian groups, and here's where the downside comes in, there's a distinct preference for boys. And when you look at material that the National Academy of Sciences looked at birth patterns among subgroups in the United States, there clearly was a, a bias in male births far beyond what would have happened naturally. Normally, there's about 105 boys born for every 101 girls. Why? Because in nature, boys die off because they're more aggressive and they can get in, I don't know, they're just less inhibited. They're prone to more accidents than girls. And so when you get to be 16 or 18, it's practically 100 to 100. But the boys die off. So when you've got a birth ratio of 100 girls and 100, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 100 girls and 121 boys, you know somebody's interfering. Somebody's interfering. Now, the downside that I had to deal with was some of these, you know, uh, now people were saying, oh, Bob Marshall is against the Asian people. I said, excuse me, the National Academy of Sciences is not a homophobic group. It's not a racial ethnic group. It's an organization that, you know, just looks at the data and makes conclusions. There is a clear preference for boys to the point where if you know that there's a girl, they may abort you. Especially if you haven't had any, you know, boys at that time. That's going on in the United States. So, if you promote legislation like this, you do have some scientific data behind you to justify this. And what does this also do? It gets the public to recognize, gee, girl, boy, that's a person. That's a human being with rights that are inalienable that are being taken away. So if you surface issues like this, in this fashion, you're putting your opponents on the defensive. Now you also have to watch about how you, how you argue with this. I mean, for years, I didn't want to touch anything other than the no funding that looked like it regulated abortion. But uh, Pope John Paul II talked about legislators being able to do things that are less than banning uh, the murder, the, the slaughter of uh, innocent children because it will have a tendency to reduce the incidence or number of children being killed, things like this. So uh, I guess it's Evangelium Vitae Pope said, if the legislator's you know, policy is no, that he's against all abortions or whatever, they can do things that are lesser than that to restrict the evil. And in Virginia, we did, we've done two things that, um, that has had the effect of restricting some of these things. We did pass a statute requiring uh, abortion clinics to be licensed as outpatient hospital centers. And we did this because there was a case that came out of uh, South Carolina where South Carolina legislature passed a law regulating the abortion clinics and it was sustained by the Fourth Circuit. Where did the regulations come from? The regulations did not come from the Vatican. They didn't come from Pat Robertson. They didn't come from Catholic priests or bishops. They came from the American Public Health Association, the American College of OBGYNs, the American Institute of Architects, uh, Planned Parenthood, pretending they're for some of these things, 
the National Abortion Federation. These were the standards they said that should be out there. And a clinic was just shut down in Fairfax, the largest abortion clinic in Northern Virginia. Because they could not meet the regulations. And about eight weeks ago, a number of us met at St. Leo's Catholic Church to organize an effort to contact the city uh, councilman and mayor of Fairfax City because this clinic wanted to go and find a bigger venue. And we found out that they couldn't meet the parking regulations, they couldn't meet a whole bunch of things. So we meet them on these technicalities. And I was on WTOP uh, last week and Hank Silverberg was asking me questions. He said, oh, come on, Bob, this is ridiculous, the width of the hallway. I said, well, Hank, if you have a woman who's given a general anesthesia and her, she's in cardiac arrest and you can't get a gurney in there, how is this not relevant? Shut him up. He had no objection to that. So you can do things that, that, that will result in that. I would caution you, however, when you speak in favor of these things, watch the verbal traps that you may set for yourself. You don't want to say, I want to make abortion safe. The abortion has to say that. You can argue we want to limit the damage. That's acceptable. That doesn't make you complicit with the with the performance of the abortion or justifying it in any way. So that is that is how I would suggest that you should argue for such things. It reduces the damage. And there is abundant evidence that when you abort a first pregnancy that you are wrecking the health of the mother and the child in subsequent pregnancies. It, it just, I mean, this, this goes back to the, to the Soviet Union in the 1930s. I, if you look at my website, elegantbob.com, under the news items, I've got a list of about 250 studies that come from the National Library of Medicine. I, do, I actually do medical research for about 20 years. I don't do it as intensely as I used to. But I've got compilations from peer-reviewed medical journals, scientific oversights, or, or studies that were funded by the federal government, looking at the outcome of births to women who had abortions. And you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. When you look at the abortion reporting form, they want to know, for some of the states that do this reporting, they want to know how many prior induced abortions you had. It's in a separate box. But when you look at the live birth form, there's one box for spontaneous miscarriage, for induced abortion and ectopic pregnancy. They collapse that. Why do they do it? Because they don't want a record that researchers can easily track on complications from abortion. Again, when you're doing the abortion reporting form, it's a separate box for ectopic pregnancy, spontaneous miscarriages, induced abortion. When you're dealing with birth, it's all three lumped together. How did this happen? It's the Center for Disease Control. Back in the late 60s and early 70s, it was run by abortionists. Um, gosh, I can't think of this nurse's name. Uh, Dovey Bolton. They were preparing data for the Supreme Court decision. Oh, Judith Bourne. Her husband was uh, Peter Bourne, who was a, uh, the drug czar from Jimmy Carter, who was arrested for selling quaaludes down in uh, Prince William County. Um, but she was, uh, she was one of the uh, amici to undo the anti-abortion laws. Here she is supposed to be measuring the complications from abortion, and she's out here advocating overturning all the abortion laws. So I, mean, I actually had an amicus brief that she filed with some people, with Doe v. Bolton. That was the companion case to Roe versus Wade. And that was the one that tried to limit abortions to hospitals, not these freestanding clinics. And the court said, no, you can't even do that. So you had people with a distinct bias collecting this data. And when they go to the reporting of it, this is very interesting, they only wanted to know the complications from the abortion at the time of the abortion procedure. Well. You don't know that a woman's hemorrhaging necessarily when she's on the table. You may be there about five minutes later. But if the complication comes to the attention 
of the abortion clinic personnel or the doctor of abortions, whatever later, the doctor's not required even anyway to report that as a complication. And a number of years ago, actually it was 1980, I think 89 and 90, a uh, public health uh, professional and myself surveyed about 1,100 doctors in Virginia. We got the uh, people who were licensed to practice medicine, who were emergency medical people, OBGYNs, and who worked in hospitals. And we sent a survey out to all these people, asked them the identical question that the CDC did, except we wanted to know, did you treat a complication from a woman who had an abortion in Virginia? Now, we're not, we really can't compel anybody to do anything. We had no authority over these people. We couldn't pull their money. We couldn't criticize them. We couldn't sanction them. We got complications back that were about 650% higher than those reported in the state of Virginia. Just me and this professor, PhD, a professor at George Washington University. So clearly the abortion complications are out there. They're just not being reported. And they're not being reported because no one wants a rap sheet to undo legal abortion. When you go back and look at the, the reasons why abortion was supposed to be made, made legal in the 1960s, it was because women were allegedly getting all these back alley abortions and they were really unsafe. And I remember, um, gosh, what's that? Faye Waddleton, the president of Planned Parenthood one time, talked about 15,000 of her black sisters were dying from abortion every year in the uh, 1960s. Well, I just went and looked at the number of black female deaths between 15 and 44. There weren't 15,000 from all causes, much less from abortion. She just made this up. Totally made it up. Fake, lie, fabrication. Did the media do anything? No. Why? Probably because their behavior is linked with abortion. Or their lifestyle might be such that they might want to consider an abortion. So you've got to look at the motive of the people who are doing some of these reportings, right, the money, to understand, are you getting the whole truth and nothing but the truth? You may not be. You have to understand that. And for all the young people here, you need to start looking at this in the future, so what you're going to do and how you're going to combat this evil, because this is now coming home to you. This is going to be coercion. This is not choice. It, it never was about choice, but it truly is about coercion at this point. Because if you can be compelled to pay for insurance to buy abortion, you can be compelled to abort a child. It's like the Chinese, and that's why Joe Biden was so soft on the red Chinese force population program because he's accepted the premises that they have. He just hasn't applied them here because it's still a little bit too gruesome that he's accepted the premises. And I know that people would be arguing, say, well, uh, we we'll just shift gears a little bit, but it's related. If you have, uh, if you have uh, homosexual uh, marriage, and I don't want to use the word gay, uh, or same-sex so-called marriage, it'll lead to polygamy. It, it was implicit in the decision that came out from the so-called Justice uh, Kennedy. It was implicit there. Why do I say that? Because the plaintiffs were groups called here G L B T. What does that mean? Gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender. Let's drop the gay, which is the guys that are homosexuals, the lesbian, which are the female homosexuals, the bisexuals. How do they get married? You've got to have at least three. And since there are only two genders, you've already accepted polygamy. And the transgender, that's also polygamy. For them to get married, these latter two groups of this anchor of you know, liberals that are pushing this are already polygamous. So it, it's not actually correct to say, well, this will lead to polygamy. It implied polygamy. It accepted polygamy. So that's already here. You just need to point this out to a few more people. And the shift in the surveys that I would contend that's going on is in part a shift to that people don't want to be looked at as bigots. Anytime I go somewhere, and I, like I said, I, I get a talk with the, I guess the head of the ACLU last uh, 
last Saturday, I met over here in uh, Alexandria. And I had all these younger people at them. Not everybody was, well, I guess they're mostly 25 to uh, 40. And the assumption was that a Republican hates homosexuals, per se, dislikes women for the most part, thinks they should be barefoot pregnant in the kitchen, whatever. So I just said, well, uh, okay, for all you liberals out here, uh, you peg me as homophobic, hateful, bigoted against the racial minorities, and thinking women are, are kind of sex slaves, and that's it. Because that, that's where the questions come from. And when some woman is out there saying, well, why shouldn't you pay for my birth control? Uh, I could have asked the question, why won't your boyfriend pay for it? <laughs> Good. Number two, do you have nine dollars a month? You go to Starbucks twice a, twice a month, you can pay for it. Number three, are you telling me that the Marines, when they were hitting the beaches in the Pacific, were out here fighting to compel me to pay for your birth control? That's what this democracy is about? Really? That is ludicrous. And, and go back in history, you have to look at some of these things in the historical context. In 1868, when the 14th Amendment was being ratified by the states, abortion was largely illegal. It was a felony. It was, uh, in a lot of the states, it was too quickening on. In some states, like Virginia, they pushed it back to conception because there was a Dr. Horatio Storer who was saying, hey, look, human life really begins at conception and you really can't you know, start saying this is out of here. Quickening was the term for when a pregnant woman felt the baby move or kick in her stomach, in her womb. That's all it was. It's an evidentiary rule. It's not a scientific statement of when life begins. It's just an objective standard when you can present evidence in court. It's not a biological reality. And it's not like Jefferson. Remember, he talks about all men are Born equal or created equal? Created equal. Created equal. There's a reason. Men were in existence before birth as human beings. And I, you know, later on, he, he wrote that in 1776, but around that time, he criticized abortion among the practice of the uh, Native Americans in a book called Nuts on Virginia. And in 1818 or so, he wrote back a letter to a guy named Sir Edward Livingston who was a political enemy of his. Livingston was asked to rewrite the code of Napoleon. Remember when Jefferson was president, the French and English were fighting. Napoleon wanted money. He wanted the United States to purchase, what, the Louisiana Territory. We did. Well, if you purchase a territory, there's got to be laws to govern this. So the code of Napoleon had, prior to that, been established there. Livingston, who was a political enemy of Jefferson's, was asked to rewrite the code of Napoleon for American usage. Livingston rewrite the code of Napoleon, and the code of Napoleon had abortion as illegal from quickening. Livingston took it and put it back to conception. This is like 1818 or 1817. This isn't ultrasound imaging. This is 18, you know, 1615, 17 and 18. He wrote it back to that point. Jefferson wrote a letter back to Livingston, and I read it, said, this rewrite, I'm paraphrasing, will place you among the Solons of mankind. Solon was a Greek, famous Greek lawgiver who reformed the laws in ancient Greece. So someone of Jefferson's authority said to Livingston, and these were some of the, one of the more significant changes in the code of Napoleon, you're going to be considered a wise lawgiver for doing this. Now you understand why Jefferson said all men are created equal, they're not born equal. He knew that human life was there. And, and you know, we've been given, you know, complaints. Well, you want to protect the God at the end of the sentence. Well, when is your definition of human life? You can't go anywhere else other than everybody has a beginning. Remember the Dr. Seuss, a person's a person, no matter how small. And what I'm asking people is say, oh, well, if you're objecting to this, then you don't want third graders in Virginia to be told human life begins at conception, because we mandate that in public schools. You must tell kids in some of these classes, human life begins at conception, because that's when it does begin. 
It doesn't begin anywhere else. But let me go back to one of his other, other points on, on a regulatory matter. We passed, I guess it was in 2012, a law requiring ultrasound imaging, the pictures to be done. I didn't vote for the bill in the end because of the way it was configured, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. We got into a box on this bill because the other side was able to compel you know, this, this argument about, well, you're compelling women to undergo transvaginal ultrasounds. Well, not really, but they were. So what I, my suggestion for compromise was that I, I couldn't get it adopted by the governor was if the abortionist does an ultrasound, then he must show it to the picture, offer the picture to the woman. So this doesn't get into us being criticized. You have to watch what you're doing in public policy, that you don't put yourself in the box that your enemy can use that really is not genuine, but it works in the public arena, of telling a doctor what to do. So my approach had the advantage of saying, OK, doc, you don't want to do it? You don't have to do it. But if the doctor doesn't do it, he or she may be subject to a lawsuit later on because they're not using the standards of the medical profession and he can't use that as a defense. So the doctor really doesn't want to do this. And I read medical journals where the, the abortionists were doing the ultrasounds at about 98% of all abortions anyway. So you didn't have to compel that. What we should have done, but what we didn't do is to say, if you do the ultrasound, whichever one you choose, you must offer the picture to the mother. That would have gotten rid of all these opponents that I could have said, that made out a woman and all these people, uh, late night shows and things like this. But our side wasn't prudent. We got the law passed, but in fact, what we did, we kind of compelled the trans abdominal, which does not show the picture as well as the trans vaginal. We, we got a law passed, but it wasn't the best because of that. So our side needs to think these things out and see what, what we're getting ourselves into when we argue for these things. So that's, that was my, that was my, uh, my observation or my, my suggestion. Uh, let me stop right now and let me, let me take some questions from you all. five blocks from the White House, Dr. San Angelo, and he's doing um, infanticide. He's admitted it. It's been on videotape with Lila Rose. Um, so what are we going to do? Because when I went there to this clinic, I met the man in the elevator. He had those devilish eyes like Bill Baird, who I met in the 70s when he came to my high school in Austin. But, but so what are we going to do about, um, I saw how should we say, infanticide containers, if you will. Is he in the District of Columbia? Three of them. Um, he is. He's you, have to go to the, you have to go to the U.S. Attorney okay. because he's the one who prosecutes and there is a federal statute against the partial birth abortion. I don't know if he's doing it this way, but that's what it would be. I offered the law in Virginia with no exceptions, no health exceptions, anything like that, on the partial birth abortion and fantasy damage. You've got to go to the U.S. Attorney and give him or her the evidence okay. about this. One of the um, lab boxes was from actually a big of Virginia. So I mean, he's having these women take the pills, go home. If they cross the state lines into Virginia, can't we do something legislatively, though? Send me the facts in that case so that I can do it. All right. Yeah, I, I will do that. What is, it, what is his address in the uh, district? It's Carol? like 22nd Street. It's 2112. It's either 2110 or 2112. 20, 21st. Okay, that's a good question. If he's doing this in the district, it's going to be their jurisdiction. Even if someone goes back to probably if they go back to Virginia where they live. And he's admitted it on video, so I don't know. But you've got to get it to the U.S. Attorney. Yeah. Okay. In the back, yes. Okay. Um, I have a question. Do you support, there's two questions. Do you support Ken Schnelli uh, and his business government? And if so, how can we help? I support Ken, but he's got handlers who are telling him to really downplay the right to life issue. Like he had this debate in um, in Hot Springs. Uh, he said, I won't use any political capital to 
last day we've lost. I don't like that. Yeah. His political consultants are telling him to dodge all this. And I think this is stupid. Uh, there was uh, myself, an attorney who won my case against the Virginia governor, and a large, uh, heavy donor to Republican causes, talked to Mark Hurley, who ran for governor against Mark Warner. And we saw what Mark Hurley was doing, and it looks like the Cuccinelli campaign. It's not that they lacked a conviction, but they weren't displaying it in a way that was giving confidence to the, to the workers out there. And we told Mark Hurley, if you don't do something, you're going to lose. Mark Hurley lost to Mark Warner. Now Mark Warner is the United States Senator. Um, the right to life have got to stop being intimidated about the view. If I were running for governor, I, I would turn, tell Terry McCall to say, oh, so really? Well, I would have thought, Terry, that the deaths of 1,040,000 children would have been of some concern to you, but apparently it's not. And moreover, you talk about the economy. What do you think losing that many children and workers has, has done to Virginia? I would reverse it on him. But that hasn't happened, and I've, I've tried to penetrate the advisors to put you I've sent them some stuff the past three days. They haven't heard back from me. But yes, I'm supporting uh, Ken. What do you need to do? You need to help. How do you need help? Get them to do it. You need to say, look, I want to hear what you're going to do on this, at least to yourself. Now, he did put back on his website some right to life things. He took it off for a while. I'm just being frank with you. He took it off. I've had fights with these Republican consultants for a long time about this. We need to contact these families and mm -hmm. say, I'm a right to life or I belong to such and such a parish. Uh, give me some stuff that I can give to my people that I can you know, share with these people in, in the parish and see what they respond to. And just go to his website and then do that. Yes, sir. If you, yeah, I think I'm on the right track. Uh, one of these consultants. Well, you're here. So well, I mean, as far as the point of view of these consultants and all the GOP establishment, they continuously claim that raising these social issues actually is politically unintelligent and will cost more than the game. But I think it's pretty obvious that in the last 10 years, it has been proven that social issues are indeed very popular, particularly in areas where they say it's unpopular for yours, and the opposite is true. Uh, this is not, uh, would I be on the wrong track to say that these people in the Republicans would say that it's a bad idea to raise them? They in fact say so because they personally are on the other side of the issue and only claim that they're for a downplay of pragmatic reasons. I'm not a mind reader, but I suspect that myself. Look, in, in certain legislative districts, it may be difficult. But most of the pro abortion people don't vote just on that concern. Right, right. I mean, you vote for somebody because he or she can build a road, they won't do this. But statewide, it is not a loser. But again, you've got to exercise some rules in how you express this. And again, I would simply say, we're, you know, it's not the best way to argue, but if you're moving by money, how much more money do you think you're paying now because we have legal abortion? Well, one of the reasons I bring that up as a follow up is because there is a certain there appears to be a kind of a block that the Virginia GOP has vis-a-vis who gets the, who gets the support um, if you're a conservative Republican or a middle of the road Republican. And I was wondering if there's a way to put the public spotlight as far as Virginia on the Virginia GOP uh, to basically show that when they say the words it's not it's not good for the election, it's not smart politics, that people will actually see that in fact they are pro-choice or in fact they are uh, pro-illegal immigration. Well, look, the, the, the judge in California, um, who was the district court judge on the DOMA challenge, or uh, on the challenge out there to their uh, referendum, Walker, when I saw his decision, I said, this guy's got to be homosexual. He's got to be living with somebody. Turns out later, the decision, he is homosexual. He is living with somebody. Some of these decisions can only be made because people are rationalizing their own bad behavior. Because there is, look, in, in 1868, sodomy was a felony. It was a felony. In 1960, it was illegal in all 50 states. Or 57 states, if you were up above. Yeah. <laughs> so you can't tell me historically that this is part of our national fabric. This is a rewrite of the past. And it's, but it takes some educated people 
who know this to push it back. You, know, you can yell that and make it a little bit of courage in a crowd to say you weren't doing this before. And then go into the cost, the healthcare cost that this kind of behavior is producing. It is enormous. And nobody wants to talk about it. I was on a CNN and I had posed an activist homosexual who was being nominated to be a judge. We did the first time, we lost the second time because the Republicans came. And the, the interviewer, this lady, uh, says, well, haven't we grown out of this? Women actually can vote and they can wear shoes and, you know, uh, you know the, the blacks can marry whites. My response was, sodomy is not a civil right. When I said that, you'd have thought the woman, I almost knocked her over. Because I went right to what they don't want to talk about. This is not about so-called equality. This is about behavior that was criminal, that is causing diseases, that causes early death. They did not want to talk about this. So you've got to bring up the topics, maybe in a shock value sense, under some circumstances, to do this. But don't let them cover up. Marriage equality? Uh-uh. We're not talking about marriage equality. We're talking about a church losing their tax exemption, about you being fired because you don't want to take pictures of a, of a homosexual wedding, of about kids standing up in class and taking sex ed courses in which behavior that shortens your life is considered normal. You've got to force it out of the area of the the channel of rhetoric that they're using because they think of, they do a focus groups, they've got a lot of money to, to message this in a way that puts us at a disadvantage. And when you've got a justice of the Supreme Court announcing with the with the aura of authority that he has, if you are opposed to these folks, you are a hateful bigot of man of mankind. Where does this guy get this proof? Has he interviewed every one of the Congress when he voted for Doma? For all the citizens who supported this? No, he didn't. He's not clairvoyant. He needs to be called out. For all I know, uh, Kennedy's a homosexual. You can't be doing some of these things without this kind of conclusion. In the back. This will be the last question. Okay. Bill Pop, it's great to meet you. I heard you over years ago on True News. My question to you is this uh, Obamacare, you know, you say, well, sorry, sorry. Short, yes. Uh, all this funding for um, for birth control, abortion, it's done by taxation. You know, most of the money comes from income taxation. Virginia is one of three states that never ratified the 16th Amendment. Now, one house, one of your houses took it up and rejected it, and the other never ratified it. If you get the other uh, house to take it up, well, the your house of the, uh, the Senate. Uh, I think it cause all sorts of problems for people on the left because it goes, it won't change the law at all, but it goes to legitimacy. It goes to, like you say, well, this is our way of saying, you know, we think we made a mistake 100 years ago when we passed the income tax. We're just going to, to, to take it up, reject it, and we know nothing will change, but we can weigh in on this. Uh, do you think there's any chance? That, that might work if this were an income tax. This is not an income tax. This is kind of an excise tax. So even if you, even if I said, hey, we're going to revisit the 16th Amendment, this is not imposed on income. Okay. This well, is the flat excise tax. All right. It, it would nonetheless make the left mobilistic anyhow. So, oh, listen, I, every morning I wake up and think to myself, how can I annoy some liberal today? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Hey, thank you so much, Bob.